Hey, good morning, Grace Church. My name is Ted Lasso, and I am a pastor here at Grace. Uh, I have a second job where I'm a soccer coach in England on Apple TV, and the first thing I do when I get in the locker room is put up the Believe sign. Um, So glad you're here, and we have an awesome church. uh, And if you're new, I hope that you're, um, yeah, that you feel safe here. You can keep laughing. It's okay. I'm owning the moment. We're going to be turning in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. So you can pull out your phone or you may have one in your hand. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and Miss Patty, our awesome usher, will hook you up with one of our house Bibles. Again, Isaiah 6. If you want to follow along with like the sermon outline, the notes, download our church app and go to hit the weekend tab and you'll see the, uh, the notes there. I, my real name is Jesse, uh, and I have four kids and an amazing wife. Happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, this last winter, I got my two older boys season passes uh, to go snowboarding. I love snowboarding and was teaching them how to snowboard, and they're really getting the hang of it, and we're going as much as we can, um, and they're really getting good at it. There's one run at Snow Summit called The Wall. You know The Wall? It's a double black diamond, and the boys are like, Dad, we think we can do the wall. And I'm like, all right, boys. And so you look at, up at the wall from the bottom, and it is overwhelming, especially for a seven- and nine-year-old boy. Boys, like, super overwhelming. I can sense the fear in them, but they're like, we want to try this, Dad. And so we get to the top of the wall, and they look over the edge, and they're like, <laughs> They get the courage, and, and, and I'm with them, and I have it all on video. It's amazing. And we drop in, and they're going down the wall, and they're getting to the bottom. And we get to the bottom, and I look at them, and they're like, Dad, that was amazing. And I was like, you did it, boys. And now they tell everybody that they did, they, they've done double black, a double black diamond run. This thing that was overwhelming and scary and huge was also incredible and exhilarating when you drop in and you, and you conquer this thing. Is it possible that fear can be used for good? In the story of our lives, fear can either write a sad story or fear can write an absolutely amazing story. So, for example, fear can drive us in a lot of different ways. Maybe you've been thinking about going back to school and finishing that degree, but there's fear about doing that. Maybe uh, you want to ask for a promotion or a raise from your boss. You deserve it, but there's just fear about making that approach. Or uh, there's a dream that you have that you've wanted to accomplish for years, but there's fear about what, that, what may happen. Or maybe there's that someone special, you're single, and there's fear about asking them out on a date. We've all been there. Most of us have been there. Or maybe there's, you're in a relationship. And you know that it's not good for you. And you know that you need to get out of that relationship. But there's fear about what the ramifications will be. Or or maybe there's a behavior or a part of your life that you know that needs to change. But there's fear about really addressing it and calling it what it is and, and working on it. Or maybe there's a part of your story that is just really painful. And it's eating you up alive on the inside. And you wish that you can find somebody to share it with. You know you need to get it out. But there's fear about letting somebody into that, that experience that you've had. You see, in our series called Facing Your Fears, we're, we're understanding that, that some of our biggest struggles and hurdles in life can find their root in the fears that we have in our lives. And so we're learning how to face our fears, to overcome our fears. So two weeks ago, Pastor Scott uh, talked about the role of fear. And, and it was about the fear of the Lord. And as we grow in the fear, like the reverent fear of God, all our other fears and circumstances begin to get smaller. Last week, Pastor Dan talked about how we need to uh, fight our fears. And it was Jesus in the storm. I've got, for like... T- Little side note, for like the last 12 days, I've been fighting a little bit of a cough. I've taken multiple COVID tests. Every time I cough in public, I feel like they think I have COVID. I've taken multiple tests, but I'm going to have to drink water and all that stuff along this way. So bear with me in that. Um, and so uh, today, <coughs> there it is. I knew it was coming. Sorry. Today we're talking about the role of fear in shaping our stories. In shaping our stories. So we all have fear. If you can put your finger on it and identify it, uh, if if we can admit it, how has fear shaped your story up until this point? 
How do you imagine fear will determine your story in the future? And is it possible that, that fear can be used in your story to, to write an amazing and an incredible story in your life? You see, all throughout the scriptures, these amazing people that have these amazing stories had moments of overwhelming fear. Some examples, Moses, uh, Exodus chapter 3, he's about 80 years old, and he's living in the desert of Midian, and then he sees this bush that's on fire, and he begins to realize that the Lord, Yahweh, he calls himself Yahweh, I am who I am, is in this bush, and, and Moses realizes it, and he turns in fear. He's like, I can't even look at you, and God says, I'm calling you to set my people free from oppression and from bondage. And Moses is like, I'm not good enough. I'm unqualified. They're not going to like me. I'm not good with words. And God's like, who gave you your mouth? And I'll be with you. And, you know, years later, there's a guy named Peter who's one of Jesus' 12 disciples who realizes that Jesus has the authority to tell fish where to swim. And they all go into this net. And Peter catches this huge catch and all of a sudden, the light bulb goes on in Peter's mind, and he falls down at Jesus' feet. He says, get away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And Jesus says, I know, but I'm, I'm calling you not to be a fisher of fish, but a fisher of man. And today, we're going to be looking at another story, a man named Isaiah. Isaiah chapter Six. He's an Old Testament prophet around 8th century B.C. In the, the, the King Uzziah has led Israel to be one of the, it's one of the most prosperous times in Israel. But he has died, as you will see. And a new, a new leadership is t coming in. And the, he's going to partner with the Assyrians, which God doesn't want him to do. And so Isaiah is kind of getting set up in this moment to speak against uh, what's going to happen in the land of Israel. Now, uh, this passage kind of ha is full of theological concepts. Theology is the study of God, theos. Um, and there's some terms that may, that are, may be unfamiliar. So I want to take a moment to just talk about those things. The first one is seraphim. Seraphim are kind of fancy angels. They have six wings, and you'll see that there's seraphim kind of flying around. Uh, another term is holy. The angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. Holy means set apart. Different, completely different. That, that God is different from us. He is the creator, and we are the creation. He is God, and we are not. He is perfect, sinless, morally, in all ways, without fault. He is holy. <clears throat> in the passage, Isaiah says, I am, I'm lost, I'm unclean, and I live among unclean people. This is he's using words to describe his sinfulness. Now, when, when I talk about sin and when the Bible talks about sin, don't take it as, like, as an insult. Oh, I'm such a sinner. You're calling me a sinner. Why you got to call me a sinner? It's not an, an insult. I like to see sin more as a diagnosis of our human condition. It's a word describing our condition as human beings. If a doctor diagnoses you with some sort of disease, you don't get mad at the doctor, right? You get, you get mad at the disease and you fight that thing and... and Sin means that uh, we are not holy. And God intentionally separates himself because he is holy and we are not. And, and he intentionally separates himself for our own good because if we see the Lord, the holy Lord, we will die and come to an end. Now there's another word in here called, it's, the, it's atonement. atonement. Atonement is a word that describes how God deals with our sin. And so there's a whole atonement history. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was uh, animals were sacrificed in the temple. And then Jesus came as the final sacrifice on the cross. And in this moment, you'll see it's like this fire that atones for Isaiah's sin and guilt. Now, this is an epic picture. And I want you to do your best to enter into this moment to see what Isaiah sees. So I'm going to read parts and then pause. And I want you to reflect on these words and the picture. And, and so I'm going to invite you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable and see what Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings. 
With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Reflect on that picture. With your eyes closed. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Reflect on that picture. Then one of the seraphim flew flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. You can open your eyes. What did you see? Isaiah sees the Lord, the king, sitting on the throne, and these seraphim are flying around and saying, holy, holy, holy. That means, in biblical language, really, 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 super, super, super holy. Like, so almighty and so powerful that angels are covering themselves, and he says, woe is me. He realizes his eyes have seen the Lord, and he recognizes his own sin, his own lostness, his own brokenness in his people, and he thinks he's going to die, but this angel comes and atones for his sin, and his guilt is taken away. And this moment, this like double black diamond, overwhelmed, can't believe I'm dropping in and seeing God in this moment, radically changes and transforms Isaiah's story moving forward. Uh, we talk about God as safe here at Grace Church, don't we? And we like that, and it is absolutely true. But one of the potential negative consequences or outcomes of, of repetition of that is we can shrink down God, God down, minimize him to, in the image that we have of God to be less than who he truly is. And so bear with me on some kind of silly examples, but we can imagine God to be like a cosmic butler, what does a butler do? He serves us, right? Oh, God, you, thank you for serving me. I just really need this parking spot because it's Friday night downtown. If you s- serve me, God, that would be awesome right about now. Or we can Im- imagine God as a divine therapist, right? God is there just to tell me all the great things about me, to affirm me. God, you love me so much. Thank you. To build up my self-confidence and my self-ego and myself, right? That I, really, I'm at the center of it all, and God is here to, to be this amazing therapist. Or God is this miraculous Santa Claus who's here to give me good gifts, right? Oh, God, I just really want this car. Please, please, please. With this house, if escrow could just go through, that would be amazing. In preparation for this message, I reread a book. It's a small book, but... I highly recommend it. It's amazing. I've read it like four times. It's by a man named A.W. Tozer. Um, It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. And I was on an airplane last week, and and just these words just just hit me. But pay attention to these words. He says, what comes into your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our own mental image of God. The heaviest burden lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him. What is Tozer saying is that that our image of God will shape so much of who we are becoming individually and corporately as a church. And so what we need to do is to have a fresh look at God in our story. A fresh look at God in our story. What is your image of God (coughs) <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing that way because there's not six feet, sorry. Uh, what is your image of God? When you worship, we just worshiped three songs. What, what was coming into your imagination? What was the eyes of your heart seeing when you worshiped? 
Is, are you open to and willing to have a new and a fresh and maybe a more true and more accurate image of God in your heart and in your mind that shapes you? Your image of God will dramatically shape your story. If you see God as this cosmic therapist who's here to boost up your ego and make you feel good about yourself and affirm your life, that will dramatically shape, shape you in if, versus if you have God, uh, your image is the Lord on the throne who is at the center of everything rather than you at the center of your life. That will dramatically change the future and the story of your life. Tozer goes on to say, the decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way toward curing them. We need to rediscover Uh, get in touch with the majesty of God. And so the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth, like the whole earth. Did you know that God is omnipresent? Did you know that? God is everywhere all the time. He's here with us right now. He will be with you tomorrow. The question is, are you aware of it? Am I aware of it? Do I acknowledge that God is here in his holiness and in his power? And if it is true, how would that change us if Jesus was to walk through those doors right now? Would our, you know, would, would our bent be towards, hey, Jesus, could you really hook me up with a new job because my current boss is awful? <laughs> that would really be awesome. Or would we fall at his feet and worship him because we can finally see or we can see and recognize who he is? is. God is like that wall, huge, powerful, and when you see him for who he is, and and that's a work of God in you, the Holy Spirit opening up that up, it it changes you. 21 years ago, I remember, I don't remember who it was, but this preacher was preaching on this passage. I was a new follower of Jesus, and it changed me. I saw the Lord in a different way from that point on. I've always wanted to preach on this passage. I think it's the first time in 21 years, so... That's a win. Uh, I was on that plane last week, flying to Iowa to officiate a wedding, reading this book, and I kid you not, I'm listening to worship, reading, and like, God is just overwhelming me with his presence. On this plane, everyone's like doing their own thing, and I'm just like, heaven is filling up my heart, and tears are coming, and I'm just experiencing God in such a random place, 30,000 feet in the air. I get to Worship God, three services every Sunday, four songs per service, 12 songs. That's a lot of worship every Sunday. And I really, I'm like, God, may this not just be a, you know, just a routine. I'm not like a karaoke, just singing songs. God, I want to see you every single time. I close my eyes and we close our eyes so that the eyes of our heart can finally see God in our, in our moments of worshiping him. In, so in some ways, we need to hit the reset button and clear out our image of, our, of the, the cosmic Santa Claus and put in its place God, the king who sits on the throne. And as we elevate God in our lives more and more to his rightful place, that is the beginning of transforming our stories into an amazing story. Now, when you have a fresh look at God, it will disrupt your story. A fresh look at God will disrupt your story. Isaiah thinks he's a goner. He's like, I'm toast. I'm gone, right? And and (laughs) seeing God can be disturbing and disruptful and overwhelming, and it is a threat to your way of living your life. Seeing God is a threat to how you're currently living your life. And we don't like disruptions, do we? This has been years of disruption and insecurity and so many things unknown. We don't like it, but disruption from God is the beginning of a new chapter. It can be the beginning of a new chapter in your life. Isaiah thinks he's toast, but in reality, God has something new in store for him. We have a medical for, a metaphorical throne on our hearts. Did you know that? I like to think of it that way. You have a metaphorical throne on your heart. It is the seat of rule uh, for your life. It determines your plans, your hopes, your dreams for your future. Um, You were born sitting on the throne of your own heart. I look at my four young children, 
and they are on that throne. <laughs> and part of my job is to help them kind of, you know, recognize that. Uh, we are at the center of our own story. We want to call the shots. We feel very comfortable there. But there comes a point for, for every woman and for every man at some point where God will look at you in his love and with his power and ask you to, take your, to dethrone yourself to allow him to take his rightful place on the throne of your heart, to take the seat of rule and, and lordship and leadership in your life. I'll never forget, I've had that moment many times in my life, but one of the most significant was at Catalina Island, uh, my senior year at UCSD. Uh, I was an economics major planning on getting my MBA and making a lot of money, um, doing something, selling widgets. And I, um, we were studying the gospel of Mark and comparing the rich ruler uh, compared to the poor widow and comparing these two responses to Jesus. And the rich man walked away because he couldn't let it go his dream for his future. And the poor widow gave everything that she had. And so Jesus honors her and lifts her up in front of the disciples. And, and in that moment, the Lord spoke to me 17 years ago. He said, Jesse, I want to take the throne in your life when it comes to your future and finances and all of that area. And in that moment, I said, all right, Lord, I trust you. And it has been hard and difficult in a lot of ways. Um, but I wouldn't change a single thing because it is, God has given me an amazing story because I chose to put him on the throne of my heart that day. Jesus on the throne of your heart will bring disruptions. He's gonna disrupt your life. Just look at the disciples and how they followed Jesus for those three and a half years. You will live with this perpetual pit in your stomach, in your gut of the things that God will call you to step into and to say and to be and to sacrifice. And, and you should, I, if I ever feel comfortable, like, hey, I got this, God, no problem. I've done this a hundred times. There's something wrong. God's like, no, you're not trusting me. I've got something more in store for you. This, God, I, I need to depend on you for what you're calling me into with this. And that is the place that Jesus wants to form our courage and our resilience and build real, growing faith in God. And where our story gets shaped into a great one. When Jesus is on the throne of your heart, <coughs> sorry, like Isaiah, you get to a point where you say, all right, here I am, Lord. Send me. It is this point where you're like, all right, God, whatever you want for my life, I'm surrendering to you. You call the shots in my life. I am ready. What is the game plan? What do I have to be afraid of anymore? I like to think of this moment in a person's life, in their story, as co-authoring your story with God. Because I don't see God as much of like dictating to you some story that isn't going to just cause a great story in your life. <laughs> it's getting worse. 11 o'clock is, they're screwed with this time. <laughs> I like to see this idea of us co-authoring our story with God into the future as we're writing it together. God has given you gifts and strengths and talents and all kinds of amazing things that make you, you, and unique and amazing. You have tragedies and failures and difficult things that God didn't cause but are a part of your story. And God is going to use all of those things in light of your history to, to co-author your future together, to he knows you to bless you, to, to make an amazing story. Um, Dan Allender is an author. He's most famous for his book, The Wounded Heart. Um, probably the best book if you have experienced abuse, particularly sexual abuse. Highly recommend it. Wounded Heart, Dan Allender. But he wrote another book called To Be Told. And in it, he says this. When I study and understand my life story, I can then join God as a co-author. I don't have to settle for merely being a reader of my life. God calls me to be a writer of my future. So if you can notice in this text, he says your past matters. The tragedies that you have experienced and gone through, it matters. But you can also uh, co-author with God a new plot in your story moving forward that is guiding you to a new ending. 
It requires us to engage the tragedies and to develop new patterns and new habits and new ways of living our lives moving forward. So what will be the end of your story? Will it be a great one? To end well, we need to live with an aim. We need to have a trajectory. We need to to have a life that is worth living for and even one worth dying for. And if you put yourself at the center of your story, you will get to the end of your story and realize, man, I'm pretty cool, but really, I'm not that great. And it was ultimately kind of a dull story with me at the center of it. Or you can realize that God has given us a target Your story, God wants your story, and here's the target, to reveal his glory. God wants your story to reveal his glory. And when you get to that point of saying, okay, God, I want my life, you to be at the center, for you to be on the throne, to co-author this thing, what do you have, God? I want to reveal your glory. I want to be about your plans and your purposes in this world. Let's accomplish those things together. Man, are you setting yourself up for a grand and amazing end of your story? Isaiah, he says yes to letting God co-author his story with him. And years later, Isaiah writes these words. He's, he's come to realize some of the promises of God. They're like in his bones. He knows them. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, Isaiah's come to realize some promises about God. God says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Notice the repetition of I am, I will. It's not about you. It's not about your power and your strength. Your spouse ain't enough. Your family ain't enough. Your qualifications ain't enough. It's about me, God says. It's about dependence upon me. And then he starts with the most common promise all throughout Scripture. You know, do you know the most frequently quoted promise from God in Scripture? It's fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. I am with you. So what do you need to be afraid of? And in this verse... God is promising, I am your God. I'm yours. Own that. Let's own each other. (laughs) Let's love each other and and be each other's. I am with you. Again, I'm not omnipresent. Know where you can go where I won't be. I will strengthen you. We get tired quickly, don't we? You know, God is inexhaustible. He never gets tired. And so we can draw upon God's strength when we, are, when we run out. I will help you, he says, like a good, good father. I will hold you up, uphold you. When you can't hold yourself up, he will hold you up because he loves you and, and he's got the strength to do it. And he ends with, with my righteous right hand. This is kind of Hebrew, cool, fancy way, old thousands of years ago way of saying, Jesus saying, God is saying, I have the authority to promise you this. My righteous right hand is powerful. You can take this promise to heart and own this promise in your lives. You can know these promises in your bones to fear not. When you take a fresh look at God and see him for who he is, when you dethrone yourself and put God as the rightful place on the throne of your heart, and as you begin to imagine and explore what your future, what your story will be like as you co-author with God. So let's bow our heads and pray. And let's come to Jesus on the throne and let's talk to him right now. Heavenly Father, we're sorry. We have so much. We have so many things as San Diegans in the 21st century, that cause us to not need you, God. And in in ways, we we diminish you and make you small and manageable and and don't know you and and live with you as who you truly are. And so, God, we're sorry. We turn from that. And God, may you open the eyes of our hearts. Maybe you didn't even come here today expecting to see God in a new way, to see him for who he truly is. But God, I, I pray that your, your spirit alone would be opening up, up, up our eyes to see you for who you truly are and ourselves for who we truly are. 
that we may decrease and that may you may increase. And in that, we may come alive as, as the death of ourselves brings new life. And Jesus, we, we dethrone ourselves. You know the beginning from the end. You know us better than ourselves. You know the things, the fears that, that you want to help us overcome. So take the rightful place on the throne of our hearts as a church, individually. God, may we trust you and hold on to your promises that the trajectory of our lives and our church would be to glorify, to honor you. Man, we want to live a great and amazing story. So Lord, if there's anyone here who's prayed that prayer for the first time ever, to realize that you are God, they want you to be the leader of their life. I want you to know that Jesus, his work on the cross was the atoning sacrifice for your sin. It is amazing and good news that your sin is taken away completely. It's the good news, the work of God. So you can come to God without fear, but just with awe, come to him. Let him hold you up. Thank you, God, that you love us, that you're all powerful, but you're also near. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.